Welcome to the Health Science Podcast, sponsored by the National Health Association. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I'm absolutely delighted today to have as my guest, Dr. T. Colin Campbell. Dr. Campbell is the uh, Jacob Gould Sherman uh, Professor Emeritus of Nutritional Biochemistry at Cornell. He's a research scientist with over 60 years of experience, 40 plus of those years on the vanguard of nutritional research, especially uh, related to plant-based nutrition. And he's the author of three major books. Uh, Many people are well aware of the China study, but also Whole, uh, Rethinking the Science of Nutrition and the Future of Nutrition, books that have truly uh, revolutionized the way the the way we see the impact and implication of plant-based nutrition on human health and disease welcome to the health science podcast brought to you by the national health association the oldest organization in the world championing the extraordinary benefits of a whole plant food diet and healthy lifestyle as well as water only fasting we believe that health results from healthful living and focus on evidence-based science that promotes the health of you and your loved ones, as well as the health of all animals and the environment. We feature experts from a cross-section of disciplines within the plant nutrition, vegan, psychological, environmental, and animal compassion sectors. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, the NHA's Director of Health Education. So welcome, Colin. It's so great to see you. It's been a long time. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. I, I really was looking forward to this, right? Yeah, yeah, me too. Actually, me too. Uh, you know, I was looking at some some of the data related to the China study, and I and I, I, I got to believe that in your wildest imagination, you couldn't have believed that this would be translated in over 50 languages and sell, sold the multi-millions of copies and had the impact that it does. It had to come as a little bit of a surprise, I would imagine. Yeah, a little story. My, you know, I was complaining about the pushback for a while, you know, something like 20, 30 years ago. My wife kept telling me, says, why don't you write a book for the public and stop complaining? And so <laughs> when I went to the publisher, they wanted me to take out all the references and put in recipes. I said, I don't even know where the pots and pans in the kitchen are. So I, I had, I really had doubts whether it was going to succeed, but it has. Yeah, but it's been great. You know, it's funny because I know you were, brought up on a dairy farm. I, I'd love to know, because I don't know this piece, what the journey was, your little bit of evolution to get to your interest in plant-based nutrition. Can you speak to that just a little bit? Yeah, it was accidental in a sense. I mean, obviously I was on a dairy farm. I, I guess I knew that animal protein is good. I went away to graduate school. I did my doctoral dissertation on, basically it was structured to advance the consumption of more animal protein was consistent with my background. And then thereafter, I, at my first university position, I was put in charge uh, or coordinating a national program in the Philippines, feeding Melder's children. There again, it was all about, you know, make sure these kids get enough protein, especially high quality animal protein. So that was all my background and I thought I was gonna be doing that. But then I saw something strange. These children had most protein, seemed to have a higher risk for liver cancer. That demanded some research, and so I came back on an anti grant that lasted for the next 30 years or so, and uh, just asked that question, does animal protein increase cancer? It sounded crazy. I mean, that was not my, my expectation, but the research was so powerful, I couldn't right. let it go. Yeah, it's kind of ironic that, you know, growing up on a dairy farm, that a lot of that early research wound up highlighting that casein, the primary protein in milk, was so carcinogenic. I think that was like really kind of a startling uh, startling discovery. I'm sure you didn't expect to necessarily see that. No, nor did my colleagues, and they warned me against pursuing that line of research. I'll bet. I'll bet they did. (laughs) Well, you know what? I want to I want to go somewhere with you because we're just a couple of scientists sitting around talking. And you know, I was I was going over something where you had really um, answered a you know provided a rebuttal to someone who was challenging you and the data of the China study. But what came out of that for me was something that I thought was so brilliant, really addressing the the real nature of scientific research and a very evolving picture of research. Because you made the point that, you know, first of all, we know that there are many experts and so-called experts 
that have their own personal bias. They, they really do a lot of confirmation bias of their opinions. And in that process, they share with the public sometimes very dangerous recommendations like excessive saturated fat in the keto diet or high protein in paleo diets, et cetera. And they all seem to trot out their own database to kind of support this. And it makes it kind of difficult for the average person who's looking at these data to say, you know, what's, what's true? What do I really believe? And the way you talked about this, and I'd love for you to speak to this, you made the point that many of these you survey epidemiological studies, like the China study or Framingham or even Adventist 2 or any of these ones that are typically even used in the plant-based world, they re really provide data that's correlative and not necessarily causative. And you have to really look at these data through the lens of something that is what you called uh, when you see these correlations, uh, do they have some plausibility based on more rigorous studies that preceded them? And do they also maybe have some clinical application where people have seen clinical results that are related to what we know makes it plausible? And then through that, if you can really uh, filter through the variables and really see the relationships, you can start to really develop true hypotheses that will really reveal cause and effect. And I thought it was so brilliant the way you created this evolving picture of science because most people just see science in a very reductionist way. We take complex things, we try to understand the building blocks, and then we make big stories about you know this reductionist model. So can you speak to that and how the average person looking at data can actually feel comfortable in believing it and having some sense of veracity of what they're reading. I have to say that is the most brilliant question asked so well I've ever heard. I've, I've been on many of these, Frank, but this, that was perfect. Um, in any case, uh, you're quite right. I, when I got into science, so to speak, uh, one thing I really uh, loved about science was the this idea of uh, sort of doing classical studies, you know, working with science essentially, uh, when we come into a question that we want to you know, we want to explore, put it into a hypothesis, uh, then there, there's a certain rigor to how to go about doing that. Especially, I had to live by that because I was thinking the opposite. And so, you know, we make a hypothesis, any kind of hypothesis you want to make, uh, then we have the responsibility to, uh, in a very transparent way, organize some experiments to test the hypothesis. Of course, the results that we got were spectacular. They were in uh, experimental animals at, at that point. But then we went through determining, is this plausible? That's another segment, as you've just stated. Uh, is this plausible? And, and the plausibility uh, data, essentially, was striking to me. Every time we looked for a mechanism, we found one. And all of a sudden, I came to this impression. You know, all these so-called mechanisms from, let's say, increasing animal protein, for example, all these mechanisms were coming up to the same result. Even though some mechanisms were increasing activity, some decreasing, the ones the activities were decreasing, they were mechanisms we had to protect ourselves from cancer. So it was 100%, no exception. I said, I finally said, hey, wait a minute, this, this is amazing. How can this all happen like a symphony in unison? So then I had the chance to go to China to have a look in a big population uh, and had a look at uh, to see whether or not what we were seeing in the lab was consistent with what we might see in China. And of course, that was a perfect thing because this is in rural China. They didn't consume much animal protein, but enough, you know, to, to see some differences between our counties. And what we saw was absolutely consistent with what we saw in the lab. So put those two together. Then the next question you just mentioned uh, well, what about these correlations? Because the China study itself was based on correlations. Well, you know, obviously, we all, our, our colleagues, and we all tend to say this, that correlations do not, does not infer causation. That's a fair statement if, in fact, we're searching for a single cause out of a big mixture of stuff. That, that's fair. But it's, that's not fair for the way that we did it. I was looking for uh, use in animal protein as the cause, but in reality, it was representing quite frankly, whole doctor lifestyle. So as animal protein goes up, plant protein goes down, you know, and, and so forth, and you're getting an antioxidant, carbohydrate, all the rest. And so I, I saw these results that were, again, highly statistically significant. 
So I conclude, okay? It was consistent with the biologically plausible argument, the data we had, number one. But number two, uh, the criticism that, is, that correlation does not, causation does not apply in that case because I'm not looking for one thing. The, the animal protein thing, for example, or the item, uh, was representing, you know, an, almost an infinite collection of all kinds of things going on. And so, you know, it's a very different paradigm, very different way of thinking about things. So, you know, between plausibility, the correlations, and then some more data that we could talk about. I mean, when I put it all together, hey, I said, this, th there's no way that anyone will ever dis discover the opposite. Colin, you also make the point that in big correlation studies that people do that because of the evolving nature of the data, you they become hypothesis generators in a way. They actually lay That's the right. groundwork for yeah. future studies. So I want to ask you a question. It's now almost two decades since the publication of the China study. Of, of all of the empirical data, which is huge data points in that survey, what are some of the strong hypotheses and rigorously tested hypotheses that you didn't realize that have come out of that over this period of time that you can that you can put your finger on? Oh wow! Yeah, one of the most striking and the most uh, almost momentous for our times is that we did research too on the causes of liver cancer caused by hepatitis B virus. It's a virus a type of disease, obviously. We were working with that in the animal model. We were using transgenic mice, you know, who, are, who, are, who had the gene for getting liver cancer. And, of course, then we had the data from China. Uh, and, and what we found, and this had started at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, I also, I recall that the pandemic was starting, that, uh, uh, that we had all these data on hepatitis B virus, some of which I hadn't really looked at. And that was the second China study. It was a collaboration between mainland China and Taiwan, believe it or not, uh, about 9,000 people. And what we learned there, Frank, was that um, people who consume, I mean, a lot of liver cancer, of course, uh, this hepatitis B virus causing liver cancer, so we had mortality data that varied across the, the country, obviously. A whole lot, 170 sites, by the way, I might tell you. But in any case, it was big, it was a big, big study. 90,000 people, we, we looked at, you know, the, the uh, uh, mortality rates for liver cancer, obviously, we had all those data, it varied a whole lot, and then we looked at consumption of animal protein or plant protein as indicators of dietary uh, lifestyle, if you will, and what we found was people consuming uh, even a small amount of animal protein, only on average, like 10% of what we do in the West, in rural China, I thought I wouldn't see anything with 10%, that's ridiculous. But we, we collected the data, or we looked at the data, and it turns out that people consuming that small amount of animal protein, they retained the virus, an active virus in their blood. Okay? At the same time, they formed no antibodies. And they got liver cancer. They died. Hmm. I mean, striking. People consuming more plant-based foods, in contrast, they're the ones that formed the antibodies. Okay? No, no answers, just antibodies. They did not get the liver cancer. There were a total of 11 correlations we had, I had access to, all of them. Significant at, significant at the probability level of 0.001. I never saw data so powerful. That's pretty amazing. So those, so those people consuming the plant-based diet, they were not getting the liver cancer. They were forming antibodies. Of course, you know, one criticism, we're, we're looking at hepatitis virus, we're talking about the coronavirus here. You know, what, what's, what's the deal? Well, it turns out, as you know, and we all really know, that viruses thrive in a condition where the immune system is in trouble. It's got a weak, difficult, right? We did that study biochemically in the lab. And what we found in the mice, you know, with the gene to get the liver cancer, as we increase animal protein, and they got the liver cancer, right? It, and at the same time, the T cells, the natural killer cells, which we all now talk about, the T cells are greatly depressed. So the animal protein depressed the T cells. Right. But in the human study, here we had evidence that people consuming animal protein, they couldn't form the antibodies. And they got their liver cancer. It was, as I say, it was the most striking uh, data I've ever seen. Uh, and so... Uh, 
I don't want, want this. To, this and, it's kind of, and, and, and in light of that, it's kind of intriguing that some of the biggest studies that were done related to the coronavirus showed people eating primarily plant-based had the lowest outcome of severity of even the yeah. coronavirus infection. So it was very consistent with the picture you've just painted. I'm here with Dr. T. Colin Campbell. We're going to take just a very short break to hear from our sponsor, the National Health Association. And now to put a smile on the sponsors of the National Health Association, you're listening to the Health Science Podcast Show. I want to remind you to visit the National Health Association website, where you'll find incredible resources to support your healthy lifestyle, including plant-exclusive eating without added salt, oil, and sugar. Simply go to healthscience.org or nationalhealthassociation.org. Be sure to check out membership, which is $35 per year for those living within the U.S. and $55 for those living outside the U.S. You'll be amazed at all the information and benefits you'll receive. As a member, you're kept up to date on the latest evidence-based tools for health promotion. You'll receive the incomparable quarterly magazine, Health Science, a beautiful 40-page advertising-free publication mailed to your home or offices loaded with articles, recipes, inspirational stories, and interviews with world leaders in the fields of personal health, plant-based nutrition, water-only fasting, animal rights, and environmental support. And you'll receive details about life-changing events, such as the 2023 NHA conference set for June 23 to the 25th, 2023, in Cleveland, Ohio which will be the NHA 75th Annual NHA Conference. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and now back to the show. Welcome back to the Health Science Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I have an incredible discussion with Dr. T. Colin Campbell. You know, I want to stay with that genetic picture just a little bit because you were one of the few people early on that said, you know what, the nutritional impact is far greater on cancer than the genetic impact. And you've, you've made that point on several occasions. So yes. it, must be, it must be interesting to you to see over these last two decades, this escalation, this explosion of epigenetic data on plant-based and lifestyle factors modifying the entire architecture of how DNA expresses cancer and proteins for cancer and enzymes for cancer. It must be a really interesting thing to see the vindication of even some of those studies you were involved in in this whole field of burgeoning epigenetics. Uh, speak to that. What do you think about all that? Yeah, I, I am aware of that. But, you know, virtually all those studies are mostly taught, except for the one you mentioned before, but all those studies tend to be focused on one thing, you know, one nutrient, one this, one that, one mechanism. You kind of thing. I, I find problems with, with that structure. But nonetheless... Uh, well, it, the, it, the, Actually, the Ornish study that he did in the uh, Proceedings of the Academy of Science was actually a full plant-based lifestyle approach that showed yes, yes. turning on and off of genes. So it's very consistent with the kinds of things you had spoken about, and we're seeing that even more and more. But yes, go, let's go into that isolated thing because I want to go one step further. You know, a lot of the plant-based docs and people that have been looking at the reasons for disease in countries, Western nations like the United States... And we know that it's the excesses of nutrition that play the groundwork, lay the groundwork for many of these disturbances, the excesses of animal protein, processed and refined foods. But yet we still have so many people spending so much of their food dollar on supplementation, getting lost in the concept of deficiency. So I want to address your, your model from whole, that brilliant book talking about the real important impact of whole food nutrition because the gold standard, and I say that kind of facetiously, is still the idea of us, uh, looking at isolated nutrients with limited effects, and there's no way we're going to address the complexity of the human body by looking at that. So speak to that. I, I think that's a very important piece for our audience. You already spoke to it. You did so well <laughs> asking the question. It's, it's amazing. But in any case, uh, yes, from our study in the rats originally looking for the mechanism. We found not one mechanism, but a bunch. That got me into the idea, uh, you know, that uh, they all work together in a sense. Um, and so, uh, and, and of course, as you may know, some of the literature, the early literature on the testing single nutrients as supplements, they have either no effect or the opposite effect, which is a sort of a hint that, that goes back 30, 40 years for me. 
Uh, but can I add one more quick question from our previous conversation? Yeah, yeah. You know yeah. The, 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 com the comments I was making about the uh, hepatitis B virus, for example, we had those data. I sent those data into Nature and, and, uh, and uh, Lancet, right? I published there before. Do you know something? This has ha never happened to me before in my career. They wouldn't even review it. That's amazing. They wouldn't review it, which, which I found disturbing. Eventually, I published it in a journal in uh, the European Commission uh, in uh, Europe. But that, that was the first one. The studies you referred to with the some evidence, that came after I had published mine. Right. Uh, but you when know, you put it all, all together, they fit like a hand in glove. You know, it's remarkable to me because I spent a decade of my life in very hardcore science. And the truth is, people don't realize that even in science, there's a lot of bias. You know, we, we think that it's very right. altruistic. And, and I, when I read how you have talked about, and you just gave an example of how the powers that be are still denigrating and reacting to plant-based studies that show positive impact. Uh, I'm just so shocked that that still is in operation because you would think we would have transcended that, but we're not. We ha it has not been transcended at all. Yeah, well, I actually have been writing another book. I'm crazy enough. I'm, I'm into a smaller <laughs> book, but in any case, I had a lot of experience in policy development in the area of food and food and so forth. Uh, and, and uh, in Washington years ago. So uh, I'm actually going to tell a story and I'm going to tell the experiences I've had on that question you just raised. Why is nutrition not understood? Or why is it so difficult for people to understand it? Because a central part of the argument is what you just talked about, holism versus reductionism. Right. I mean, holism is where is that? We got to just accept that. All of think working together, they come into the cell and they like a beautiful scene that arises it's called nature it, it, it just sort of reacts in such a way when you got the right food that it does the right thing and and it, it does it on a very broad basis it's not just heart disease it's not just you know, chronic kidney disease it's right. not just diabetes. you know you know the story is we'll get into this later but it's just so sad that you know so much of the population gets lost, gets trodden underfoot with this idea that isolated nutrients rather than whole plant food nutrition is the way to go. So they, and I, and I find it abhorrent in a way that people with limited food dollars spend so much of their, you know, discretionary income on nutrition, on supplementation, rather than on whole foods, when it's whole foods that provide the panorama of nutrients, some of what, most of what we know and many that we don't know. I mean, there's so That's much true. going on in Whole Foods that uh, that people are, are are bypassing, they're sidestepping, and you've addressed it so beautifully in Whole, which uh, I think should be required reading for the entire population without any question at all. So, you know, I, I don't know how we, I don't know how we address that mentality and get people back, you know, from that abyss that they really gone over with this isolated nutrient mentality. But let me ask you a question because it's always portrayed that. Yeah, even for people that agree that whole foods provide a kind of symphony of nutrients that really relate to the complexity of the body much more directly. But there's still this idea that if we look at the literature, they'll tell you that iodine is a global deficiency. And in vegans, you know, B12 will create con combined system disorder deficiency. So is there a place in your mind, in your model, for the application of isolated nutrients within the context of that bigger picture? Well, I'm always open to the possibility of seeing something like that. And my best answer to that, I think, Frank, is that, uh, yeah, I can allow for the fact that uh, a single nutrient given a, a, a person who is short on that nutrient or, you know, is compromised in some way, you might see a, you might see what looks like a positive effect. Usually those effects observed are single things themselves. It may not last very long, but then there's a, the, the upside risk, you know, of that, of uh, having the opposite effect from what you, you might expect. And it's certainly for sure, those supplements do not substitute for whole food change. Right. Well, that's so, why they call that's why they're called supplementation and not yeah, that's right. supplementation. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. So, uh, you know, I, I, I to make to convey that to the public is not that easy. Um, and uh, but nonetheless, you already said it well. I mean, we got to pay attention to the to the whole food and, and that's plant food, to be honest about it. And so that Mother Nature, when she has to look at this food we consume, she knows what to do with these millions of different things all working together.
I find it a spectacular idea. I, I call it the biological theory of, uh, of relativity, to be honest about it. Yes, beautiful. <laughs> now, I'm, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. One of the uh, foundations of the National Health Association since its inception was the um, attachment or the use of therapeutic water-only fasting. And I know there was a time in your life where that was something you entered into because of your connection with the NHA. Can you speak to how that experience informed you as a nutritional researcher, as a scientist, from your own personal experience, and then in some of the research that you actually wound up being involved in at True North and so on? Can you speak to that impact on your own career, on your own mindset? Sure. My, that my story started back in when I was at MIT in a postdoc position, isolating a compound uh, that was causing a lot of toxicity. Uh, it was known then as Agent Orange. And I, I worked on that a couple of years, isolated the compound. I didn't get a structure, but it turned out to be dioxin, as I was to learn a couple of years later. So I got a really heavy dose of dioxin working in the lab. My colleague at FDA in Washington died at the time. He's 41, working with it. I ended up with polyps that had to be cauterized and you know, other problems. And they kind of stayed with me for the next 25 years, affecting my speech, uh, and quite frankly. Finally, uh, then I was asked to give a talk at the National Hygiene Society, I might add, in Hofstra that time. And uh, the, the fellow, Jerry Deutsch was his name, who invited me down to give the talk. I explained to him, I said, you know, I got a problem, Jerry. I, he was a Cornell graduate. I said, I, I don't think I can speak well. He said, well, come on down. He says, you got some people. You'll have some people down here that think about this whole thing in a rather different way. So I went down. Ten guys got together. Maybe you were in the ten. I don't know. I, w I was in that group. Yes, I was. Yes. Okay. Well, I thought that it just occurred to me. You probably were. But yeah. in any case, Alan was, Alan Goldham was sitting there. And uh, so he, in turn, you know, suggested, and the society did too, why don't you go and you know, look after yourself? Uh, go, go out and do a fast. And so I tested myself for dioxin. That was the Canadian authorities did that. You know, I had levels of dioxin in my blood 800 times the amount oh. allowed. That's that was 25 years later. So I kind of put two and two together and surmised that maybe the doctor's is causing a problem. So Alan says, come on out and do the, the, uh, the fast. I had nothing to lose because I thought I was going down the tube. And uh, so, you know, I went out and did it the first time for 10 days. No, 12 days it was. Uh, I didn't see much effect, but I came back a year later because Alan says, you know, it's going to take a little while to, to get onto this. Then that time I came out with my wife just for company sure enough it must have been about like next three or four weeks when i came home on obviously a plant-based diet then i was 100 percent of this so you know the plant-based diet idea on the one hand fasting on the other i'm getting really enthused about this <laughs> and so sure enough you know now i'm talking again as you know and uh, you know it it, it, it was uh, remarkable and i can't give alan quite frankly enough credit uh, because he uh He's a very good friend of mine right now, of course, and the whole fasting idea I've been there twice more since. Uh, and uh, I, my, my take on that uh, is that, and Alan, we talk about it, I, I think the fasting idea to me is, is a good place to start for anyone who has a difficult problem of sorts, can't quite know what to do, go ahead and do a fast, and then understand, too, that when you're coming off the fast, you got to be, better be plant-based you know, to continue the momentum. And so, yeah, I, yeah, I, we, we've learned that the refeeding part of the experience is one of the most important because yes, yes, you, can do, yeah. you can do a lot of damage when you start introducing food if you're not careful. And the plant-based approach, especially without the added salt, oil, and sugar, which we've kind of gone to now, makes yeah. such a huge impact in the refeeding phase. So, yeah, so that was a very important and interesting experience. I'm here with Dr. T. Colin Campbell uh, and having a remarkable discussion. Uh, Colin, let people know how and where they would go to follow you. What would be a location online, a website, or a place where they could get more information that uh, they could follow you? Yeah, we have an online course, called, and the, the program is that Nutrition Studies, that's plural, one word, nutritionstudies.org. Uh, that was uh, with an online company owned by Cornell at first. I, I put it on there. I've been teaching on campus, but uh, that's another story. I, I, I couldn't continue it, so I put it on that online thing. 
then after a while, we had a big response. It was very good. Uh, now it's totally within the Cornell uh, structure. Uh, and uh, we've had a lot of success with that. Uh, I just, uh, we're adding some more. It's just been translated. It'll be coming online for the, the entire thing is translated in Spanish. So we have wow. it both in English and in Spanish, and now the Italians want to do it too, and so forth. It's it's been exciting. My my daughter, uh, who has a PhD in uh, uh, education and curriculum development, is now the president. Uh, she was in the Peace Corps, so we've got this international outreach, national, obviously national coverage as well. So yeah, that's what that's my thing. Uh, make, making another book too, I guess will come. Out. I hope to come out sometime soon. Well, I got to give you credit. I mean, you never stop going. And the, and this is a real interesting piece because uh, you not only do the research and, and have all this information, but you walk the talk. So tell people, even at this advanced stage of your life, you're going strong. You got, you're a game changer yourself by embracing this lifestyle. What's a day in, what's a day in the life of Colin Campbell? What, what do you do for, act, what are you doing for physical activity? What kind of things do you do to keep yourself in the kind of shape you are to be able to stay as productive as you are? Well, it was in 1980, by the way, quite a long time ago, when I was on a National Academy of Science panel, uh, you know, tried to sell my colleagues on this a little bit about the plants. I mean, it wasn't all the way there, but we started to change, my wife and I, and she bought into this. We had young children, and so she really liked it, because obviously, and so we gradually started to change over the years, and we were uh, essentially almost complete by the time that she got diagnosed with advanced melanoma. And at that particular point in time, you know, what in the world's going on here? You, you look at it, we we're doing pretty well, we thought, right? Well, I went into the lab with the uh, pathologist and had a look at the melanocytes and where they were and so forth and so on. And, and based on some research in England at the time, those melanocytes were in a place that reminded me that the possibly this was, a, this was a lesion that had occurred before and it was going backwards. It was already reversing. But nonetheless, we really became pure about the thing. Uh, and that was in uh, 2005, I guess. Uh, the the uh, surgeon wanted to, uh, first off, um, take out that portion of her lymph glands of her groin area and then put her on chemotherapy. She said, no, she did nothing. Well, that's been 18 years ago, and she's had no recurrence, obviously. Uh, oh, wow. So that's that's one thing. Uh, and then just recently, I might add, too, we got the, uh, the COVID coronavirus just about a month ago. We did not get the vaccine. I know this is very inflammatory, so you, you can edit it out if you want to. But, you know, we, we did not get the vaccine purposely. And then we got infected about a month ago or so. We were tested positive. Well, we, and, and, of course, everybody's nervous about our, our age. What in the world are you doing? Well, you know, I had, I had the symptoms for about six days. No headache, no fever, uh, no nausea. All I had was just some sleepiness. My wife the same thing, a little bit of cough went with her, and that went for about eight days. So we sailed through it like, you know, a rest period. And that just happened recently, you know, That's with beautiful. no vaccine. I know I'm saying infl inflammatory stuff, but I'm just telling the truth. That's what happened. But, but, your, but your results are very similar to people that stay plant-based. The, the response of the immune system is really remarkable. And it is. You, and it you is. go through it, like you said, like a whisper. Well, Colin, as we as we kind of wind this down, I want to get into the final, the implication part of this, because in your book, The Future of Nutrition, you take on corporate nutrition. You take on people making policy that really are diverting people away sometimes from the really true things that they need to embrace. Like they're still highlighting the importance of animal protein or isolated nutrients. How do, how do we deal with that at that level of policy and how can we alter the consciousness of the population when you're dealing with powers that be that are diverting them away from the truth? Well, for one thing, I, I reduced this very complex area of medicine, if you will, biologically speaking, down to two ideas. Don't eat animal, animal food. We've got plenty of evidence to show that's not a good idea. And number two, try to eat them whole, you know, as much as possible so other nature knows what to do with all these these resources she has when you consume it, basically. Two ideas. Just, and so the first thing I'll say, let's keep the message simple. And of course, the National Hygiene Society has been doing this for what, 75 years, 80 years? 75 years. Coming yeah, up so, on 75 years. 
So in any case, uh, I said, go, go see Dr. Sabatano in the meanwhile. But <laughs> in, in any case, I think, you know, keep the message simple. That's for starters. And then just being vocal about it, you know, whenever the opportunity arises. I mean, I was involved in the sort of policy background stuff, as I said before. And it, unfortunately, this sounds horrible, but, you know, in our government, we have one agency, one department that tells us what food to eat. We subsidize the production of it. That's the livestock and, and dairy right. industry, right? So right. that's what the, that agency does. It creates a lot of sickness, a lot more sickness that needs then some help. Well, the other next second agency, Health and Human Services, that Johnson called that he told them directly to their themselves that you're, you know, the pharmaceutical company you own that department or that that was way back in 1969. So we got one of them, you know, telling us, you know, what to eat or being very careful with this good information, won't tell it exactly. It creates sick people. The other department is uh, providing the drugs to uh, fix us. I find it just, I know I'm, I'm being very... Uh, it's, no, it's, uh, a reprehensible, it's a reprehensible conflict of interest. I mean, it is what it is. It is a reprehensible, yeah, exactly. And, but the bottom line is you're still feeling that there is hope within this. Within yeah, the, I, I, yeah, I do. Okay. For, for one thing, the word plant-based, for example, that I first had in 1978-79 when I was on a, a cancer research committee at the time for NIH. But in any case, that word took a long time to circulate. And I didn't think it would ever get out. But, you know, the word plant-based is kind of out there. You know, whole food plant-based. Uh, and uh, that, the people who are historians who talk about trends and so forth, as you well know, one of the first things that needs to happen is to get some conversation. Just use, create some words. Get some conversation going that will circulate and you know and so it's a start right, right it's a start right. so i think it's possible that if we come back and remind uh the government to, when working with medical schools first off make sure that nutrition is taught properly in medical schools that's one thing a big deal in right. my own community we tend to focus all the time on single nutrients and we worship animal protein we, we've, we've gone crazy too <laughs> and so, you know, we, somehow we got to come back to that department. And I've been working on that for quite a long time. Uh, and so uh, it's a tough sell, uh, Frank, because we, we're dealing with big powers. Got it. Colin, before we break, do you have any final words of wisdom or advice you'd like to share with the audience out here? And yes, this is the best interview I ever had. And I had many. Your, you, your, 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 your questions are very professional, very informed. Uh, you and I, I guess, on the same page. We have been for a long time. Uh, no, I, I don't know uh, words of wisdom. Um, or advice or whatever you feel. Yeah, just try it. I, I think maybe just try it and see how it goes. And, and you know, that a lot of people have done that from McDougall to Esselton, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But, you know, if you organize a group of people that only are doing it for 10 days or so, they, they they may see the results, and they do see the results, but they don't stay on it very much. And my son Nelson, by the way, uh, my oldest son Nelson, he'd been doing these jump stars. He's the one who produced the film Plant Pure Nation. Right. Following the, the, and in any case, he's he and his wife have been working on this concept right now, and got another movie coming out actually, on Beautiful. on taking this this idea and addressing the question concerning why don't people stay on it. Well, I have some Italian friends I've known for a long time who I think have resolved that question. Namely, if you put people on for 10 days to do something like that, yeah, you see the results. And even though they see the results, only about 10% or so, you know, uh, stay with it. What the Italian people have done, they went into the program telling people, uh, we got a nine-day program for you. Will you try it? Okay, we'll try it. After the nine days is up, they come back to them and say, would you like to do another 15 days? By this time, they're pretty motivated. And, oh, yeah, we'll try another 15 days. They did it three more times. Finally, by the time they got to, got to about 70 days with that, everybody's <laughs> taste preferences had changed. Beautiful. So there was 100% change. So it comes down to the point I've often been making is, yeah, it's a hard, it's a hard shift. Let's, let's face it. Very difficult for various reasons on one hand. But if they can actually cause their taste preferences to change, they're home free. Well, I, want to, I want to really thank my special guest, Dr. T. Colin Campbell, and I encourage you 
to follow Colin online. The uh, websites will be in our show notes. And I really want to thank the audience out there for uh, being with us. Uh, without you, we can't do what we do. And on behalf of the National Health Association, I want to uh, wish you happy holidays. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino, and I really look forward to being with you on the next episode of the Health Science Podcast. Thank you so much, Frank. Really appreciate it. You've been listening to the Health Science Podcast, brought to you by the National Health Association. Thank you for joining us today and for your commitment to evidence-based health science that backs a whole food plant-exclusive lifestyle and contributes to the well-being of all people, animals, and our environment. I'm your host, Dr. Frank Sabatino. Be sure to leave a rating and a review, and we'll see you on the next show.